Welcome here at uh, Seismic Radio and uh, today talk on uh, the Crusades. The Crusades, an act of love? That's the question. This is an article which has been, uh, which uh, is, I've posted on godinanutshell.com. So you can read the article on www.godinanutshell.com. Uh, the question is whether the Crusades were an act of love. Now, um, when I look at the uh, modern mindset and of uh, spineless historians in the West, um, they uh, consider this to be the darkest chapter in Christendom. Uh, modern historians uh, love to fornicate with the zeitgeist of uh, political correctness and become highly apologetic upon this era in European history. Muslims love the term crusader. It's something they can uh, rub in and mention all the time with utter disgust of, uh, you know, the West having done something terrible to the Muslim world by uh, sending its knights and its soldiers to the Middle East. Now, they uh, obviously, they always praise Saladin. Saladin is one of the greatest heroes who, after 150 years of successes and of establishing um, Christian rule, in the Middle East, or re-establishing Christian rule in the Middle East, um, that he, he put an end to it. Now, the, the problem when we look at the Crusades is that uh, very often we look at historical events with, a modern, with modern eyes, with a modern mindset, and uh, the next problem is that uh, in our day and age we tend to believe the people who shout the loudest rather than analyzing historical facts and historical events in the context as they were happening. Now, uh, the statement I'm making is the Crusades were justified and necessary. It was necessary for them to take place to protect, Europe, to, to protect the future of Europe. Uh, the call to arms by Pope Urban II and by Bernard of Clairvaux. Now, Bernard of Clairvaux was uh, a cleric who was highly recognized. He was a, a monk and one of the biggest authorities of his day. Um, anyway, both of them did a call to arms. And very often Bernard Claveau, who is seen as a quite an enlightened character, um, this is sort of put down as one of the darker things in his, uh, in his career of what he ever did. Uh, I tend to disagree and I say it was one of the wisest uh, things he did and one of the things which had to be done at the time. And, um, and I, I don't believe that there is any question about it. So I don't believe modernist, secularist uh, historians or even theologians who uh, who say that this is all wrong and it should have never happened. It, it had to happen. It had to happen. There was no question about it. Um, both of them did a... This is for the First Crusade. It was about uh, 1080. So it was about 400 years, a little bit more than 400 years after uh, the Islamic conquest started. And... Um, when we look at the, the call to arms for the Crusades, uh, the only point we could really make is why so late? Why didn't it happen a lot earlier? There were thousands, if not millions of Christians who were getting slaughtered in Northern Africa, in the Middle East, who needed protection or needed defense, and nobody cared for them. Nobody did anything about it for hundreds of years. And only then, uh, in uh, 1080, I think it was 1088 or some, something, around about those dates, um, the call to arms came and the Crusades began. Um, if the Crusades had not taken place, there is a good chance that Sharia law would have uh, graced the constitutions of Europe and that our pl places of worship would be surrounded by minarets proclaiming the message of a different God under the threat of the sword. Now that Muslims love to forget when they shout crusaders is the immense amount of blood they've shed in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, later in North Africa and uh, throughout the Middle East, on behalf of the God who can only spread his message by his servants going on a killing spree. Now, the blood that was shed was mostly Christian. Uh, Europe was silently watching whilst two-thirds of Christianity at the time was ruthlessly slaughtered, enslaved and turned into third-grade citizens who were who were exposed to a, a special tax, you know, for uh, furthering the cause of Islam if they survived, um, and if they, if they, um, if they were given the opportunity to pay this tax. Fortunately, in later years, there were enlightened caliphs who uh, saw the value of having Christians in the empire uh, because of the additional taxation they could impose, and uh, they, they tended to leave them alone. So, in some bizarre way. Um, 
Mohammed established a rule which would ultimately protect Christians, but initially, especially in the days of conquest, of the Islamic conquest, uh, there was pretty much the option of conversion or death. Um, many, many Christians they would prefer to die than to follow this, uh, this new God they were proclaiming. Weaker nominal Christians were converted to Islam by force. It is interesting to see that we are still waiting for an apology from the Islamic community for the bloodshed resulting in genocide committed to our brothers and sisters, whilst they never seem to stop demanding apologies from us for the Crusades. Now, it has to be said that in the Crusades there were a lot of things which weren't right and cannot be justified by any means whatsoever. And, and we need to acknowledge this as Christians as well. But then on the other side, we have Islamic hordes uh, killing and committing genocide um, again and again and again. There was always an, an uproar, and it's something we are seeing right now as well in Syria and in other places, uh, where Christians are beheaded uh, en masse, and, and nobody says a word. Um, I'm quite disgusted by, um, by some of the powerful nations in this country, in, in this world, who are okay to um, send millions of pounds or billions of dollars of troops to save a few oil wells, because that's what's important, you know, money, commerce, and so on. And yet there are uh, injustices happening, there are Christians getting slaughtered, and, and nothing is happening. No, the, the comment is made that there will be no groups on the, on the ground, there will be no defense, which pretty much gives these guys impunity to go within their towns, uh, which they control, and to murder people who are not willing to turn to Islam. And that's what we are seeing today. I'm not surprised, I mean, there's some rumors going around that uh, the guy who's in charge of this and who, you know, who makes those decisions of troops not to go there, that he is a Muslim in himself and he probably favors the death of Christians. Um, I don't know whether this is true or not. Um, there's a lot of testimony and there are a lot of witness reports who say that the guy is clearly a Muslim um, at the top of the chain of command and his decisions pretty much reflect uh, whatever is happening there. Uh, as I said, I'm disgusted by that. I'm not calling, it's not another call for, cru for a crusade, but it's just establishing some facts here. And then looking back on these guys um, going almost a thousand years back who, uh, who had something to fight for and they went and did it. Now, uh, let's have a little bit uh, a look further of the whole issue about the Crusades. We've got the, an Islamic scholar described, uh, who describes the difference between Christianity and Islam as follows. Uh, the spread of early Christianity was signified by persecution and dying for the name of Christ. This is pretty much the first 300 years of Christianity. Uh, this is what was happening. People were dying for the name of Christ. Um, when, Make it cancel. when we... Um, when we look at um, the spread of Islam, in contrast, it was signified through conquest and, and for people dying in jihad, which is in war, in the process of killing others for the advance of Islam. So that was pretty much what signified is Islam. From the year 622 to the turn of the first millennium, it was a story of persecution of the biggest Christian community in the world uh, that at that time, which was based in North Africa and the Middle East, almost all of the Church Fathers come from North Africa and underline this fact. Today, North Africa, other than Egypt, is almost 98% Islamic. Now, um, just to sort of go a little bit further into this, a lot of Church Fathers came from basically what is today the Islamic world. Almost all of them came from the Islamic world. There were quite a few from Minor Asia, which is Turkey today. And, um, and then obviously there are uh, a lot of them uh, which came from North Africa. So uh, Christianity really was happening in North Africa and, um, and population-wise, the majority of Christianity was, was based in those areas. So we're talking North Africa and then going all the way up to the Middle East, including Saudi Arabia as well. There were a lot of Christians there as well. Now, many of them died or were slaughtered or were put into servitude, became slaves, or were forced to convert to Islam. Despite the onslaught by the Islamic hordes of, in the Middle East, uh, um, when the, they took a census in about 1900, about 20% of the population in the Middle East would describe themselves as being Christians. So we are not looking of a, of a you know, tiny minority, but there were Christian groups throughout the Middle East who would not bow down to Islam and, and stood their ground in 
their allegiance to Jesus Christ. And, um, and they were there till about 1900. And then due to pressure and ongoing persecution, many Christians escaped to Europe or to America in the 20th century. So it's reckoned that the current population of traditional Christians in the Middle East is estimated to be about 5%, in addition to an unknown figure of underground Christians who have converted to Islam due to divine revelation. There's some bizarre stuff happening at the moment. In the Middle East, a lot of Muslims have visions of Jesus. Jesus appears to them in their dreams and they come to Christ um, just out of the blue, without any missionary input or any... Um, or anything really. It's just due to divine revelation to them. And it's, it's really interesting as well. There have been many attempts to reach out to the Islamic world uh, for at least the last 500 years, and most of them failed. Yeah, they, they didn't really get anywhere. It was just witnessing and testifying to people in the Middle East, and, and very few conversions, if any, could be, could be noted. At the moment, it's just the other way around. The, the missionary effort has virtually disappeared to, to zero. Uh, there's very, very little. There's some missionary effort there, but missionaries on the ground are very few and little. Um, and yet, uh, people are coming to Christ right, left, and center in the Middle East. And we are, we are talking right in the heartland of Saudi Arabia, of uh, Iran, Iraq, um, Syria, and, and those places, Turkey as well. Uh, I met one woman who uh, was a, a Muslim, a pilot, and, um, and, and she just heard from other pilots the gospel and decided to become a Christian. It's just really bizarre. It's, it's, things are happening there which, which never happened before. Okay, we've got a map here. If you listen to the radio broadcast, I, I quickly have to describe the map. This is the map of Islam at uh, the turn of the millennium, roughly about the turn of the millennium. And what we see is all of North Africa is, has been turned to Islam. Then we've got Spain as well. Interestingly, Spain didn't really give up Christianity and they stood their ground in not converting and in resisting um, the uh, false proselyte, uh, you know, being proselytized forcefully. And then we've got Saudi Arabia, uh, all of the Arab Peninsula was, um, uh, was Islamized. Um, and then we go into the Caucasus, uh, right to Afghanistan, um, to Turkmenistan. Tajikistan, those areas, and then we've got, and interestingly, not all of Turkey, but just um, the, the regions of Armenia and Georgia, where we find Armenia and Georgia today, and those regions were, um, again, forced to, uh, to be put under Islamic control. Interesting as well, Armenia is a very strong Christian community, as is Georgia, and there are people groups who would not bow down to Islam, and this is something which has to be reckoned for. They've had pressure for for years. Armenians, uh, there was a genocide at the beginning of uh, the last century, so we're looking somewhere between 1880s to 1915, uh, 1920, where about uh, 1.5 million, uh, some figures say 2 million people were murdered in, in various ways. Um, interesting as well, it's something similar which was happening before. Uh, the Armenians um, they lived around the Lake Van, and um, they were Christians, they were a Christian community, and they were heavily armed and um, to defend themselves, which, which was natural, because they were in a, in a very hostile environment where they weren't liked, weren't loved, on account of their confession for Christ, and uh, they took out the right to arm themselves. They had some, some strike forces, so if any Armenian was uh, murdered on account of his religion, they had a group who would... Um, secretly go out and defend uh, those guys. So they were uh, some sort of like assassins or something. It's a really interesting story when you ever, if you ever have time to, to read about this. But that was a necessity just to protect themselves and to protect their way of life and to protect uh, what they stood for. And, and uh, anyway, what, what happened is the um, Turks and the Kurds who were living in that area, they forced to disarm or encourage the Armenians to disarm themselves. Once they had disarmed themselves, um, they were all gathered together, and then they, uh, they were led to their death. There were certain death marches. In 1915, uh, around about there, there was uh, a Russian general, just before the revolution, who um, uh, realized what was happening. They invaded Turkey, and they rescued a lot of Armenians at the time. So uh, if, if you uh, say today that the Russians are all bad, the Armenians have to be grateful to them, at least for one stage. That, um, that, they, that they were rescued by them and defended by, by Russian forces.
and hence uh, I would imagine Armenia was incorporated later on into the Soviet Union. But anyway, um, there are a lot of parallels today. Uh, I know that in America there's like a heavy political agenda to disarm the populace, to disarm the people. Uh, I wonder what happens after they've all been disarmed and, uh, and what we see after that. Um, okay, just a thought on the side. Anyway, uh, this is what was happening in the Middle East and you can see the map. Um, what we see is that two-thirds of the, f the old Christian world had been Islamized, it just disappeared. All that was left was just a small strip of the Mediterranean, that's probably about a third on the, of the Mediterranean which was still under Christian control. And, and it was sort of getting less and less all the time. Um, the, uh, the north, by the way, the north of Europe um, at the time was sort of so-so. There were some Christians here and there, but uh, there wasn't, uh, um, wasn't quite as strong as yet. Uh, Scandinavia uh, came to Christianity quite late. Uh, the northern tribes of Germany, I would imagine it was very similar. But at the time, we're talking about the millennium, um, the, the heart of Christianity was pretty much the Mediterranean Rim, and two-thirds of it was, was Islamized at the time of the Crusades. So, what should the, should the Crusaders do um, at the time, or what should the people at the time do? They knew that Islam, the, the concept of Islam was conquest, and they were trying, they were trying to fight in France, they were um, trying to, you know, get Italy from the north, Italy uh, was in trouble from the, from the east, and um, we, we got obviously the Eastern Christians as well in Constantinople and Byzantine, and um, they were under threat as well. They they were fe fearing for their for their status quo, for their lives, because these Arab hordes proclaiming a new god, uh, which and desecrating pr pretty much the the god they believed in, Jesus Christ. Uh, don't be fooled the Jesus Christ which, which is in the Quran is not the same Jesus Christ which is in the Bible and the God in the Quran cannot be compared with the Bible. To give you one fact and I'm going to leave it at that, this uh, Muslims they praise themselves on all the different names of God, you know, the merciful, the this, the that and the other, that one name is love. You know? God hasn't got the, the name love, whereas the New Testament is full of love, That's uh, as far as God is concerned. God so much loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Love is the key in the New Testament. Quran doesn't know about this. Quran only knows about murder, killing, slaughtering, uh, strange laws. That's, that's what the Quran is about. Okay, uh, right, we, <coughs> we go further. At the turn of the first millennium, Europe was in trouble. For 400 years, nothing had been done to protect Christians and Islam was now encroaching on Europe. Historians have found evidence that Christians in the East were asking for help from their Western brothers to stem the threat to their lives and their freedom to follow Christ. So that's interesting as well. It's, it's a fact which has never really been said. There were Christians, and there were Christians under Islamic control, and they were suffering. They were really suffering. And they were crying out for help, and nobody would come. You had these united... At, in times, at times, United Arab armies and forces, uh, they couldn't withstand. And, um, <clears throat> and it was just a horrible time. So people were asking, saying, please help us, help us uh, from these guys who want to, to kill us and to take away uh, the most precious thing we have, which is our faith in Christ. <clears throat> in addition, holy places which define Christianity were in the hands of people who had very little respect for them. So we're looking at Israel, we're looking at Jerusalem. <coughs> at the time it was very important for Christians to, to do pilgrimages. It's a bit like today we go on a holiday to Spain, to Madeira, to, uh, or if you're in America you go to the Caribbean or somewhere. In those days people went um, to, um, to do a pilgrimage once a year to you know, get some time off, uh, reflect on their lives and uh, in, enjoy themselves. For them it was very important. So it was a different lifestyle and it might be very hard to understand from our from our perspective. So a lot of people at that time would do a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, the place where Jesus was, if they had the resources and the opportunity to do so. Now what was happening to some of these pilgrims was that um, obviously the um, Muslims had very little respect for Christians, they were pretty much free game. Uh, the Quran and the Hadith was endorsing the slaughter of Christians and, uh, and so they 
um, very often found themselves going on a pilgrimage, you know, being pious and devout, wanting to see where Jesus lived and uh, where everything took place. And they were captured, put into slavery, murdered. And this news was coming through to the West as well. So um, something which was considered to be holy and uh, a privilege of Christianity uh, was taken away from them by, by these guys. And so um, it became very important to, to do something about this. So we had two things. We had the, actually we had three things. We had the potential of the Islamic conquest moving into Europe. We had the cry for help from other Christians in the Middle East and we had um, the violation of Christians who were guests within the Islamic Empire at the time, wanting to visit Jerusalem and, and ending up being enslaved or murdered. So, th so there were three things which were quite serious at the time and they, they required a response. Um, so what should Europe do? There's a big question. Uh, wait for the conquest to land on the doorstep. So uh, one thing was clear at the time that uh, the conquest was carrying on and on and on. And Europe could either sit and wait for them to be on their doorstep or they could start confronting them, um, pre preferably not on Europe's turf, but on, on the Islamic turf, on the Muslim turf, as they were moving, moving further, um, further west. Um, what else should they do? Should they ignore the pleas of the Christian brothers in the East for help and protection? <coughs> Is this the right thing to do? People ask for help and you deny to them. Carry on betraying Christians in the Middle East who were relegated to third-class citizens, enslaved, humiliated and slaughtered. I mean, that's what's been going on for about 400 years, that nobody, nobody did anything about it. Yeah? We had North Africa, we had the Middle East, we had a very high percentage of the population. We're looking probably at figures going up to 80% and higher, calling themselves Christians, whether they were real, born-again, Bible-believing Christians or they were just uh, uh, traditional Christians is a different question, but, but um, there were about 80-90% of the population within that area would consider themselves to be Christians. And they were no, uh, you know, a sword was put to their necks and they could decide to either become a Muslim or to stay Christian. Even though Christianity doesn't define itself as a political force and doesn't sanction warfare from a biblical perspective, the medieval mindset did join political, cultural, religious and religious life together and the world would see a need to warfare and, and the mindset, the medieval mindset would see a need to warfare to defend their freedom and faith. Now, this is very difficult to understand for the modern man who embraces secularism. Yeah. And in secularism, you think, why should I fight for religion? And, and the problem is we take freedom of thought and freedom of religion for granted. And uh, freedom of religion in the Islamic world is only freedom to, to convert to Islam. That's all. Yeah. If you are lucky, they let you live if you are a Christian or a Jew. If you are a Hindu or anything else, you won't have a chance of survival. They'll just kill you. And that's pretty much what the Quran and what the Hadith preach and say. So never be fooled. Don't be fooled. What ISIS is doing at the moment is pretty much what the book says. And, um, and again, it's a different subject and it doesn't fit into here. But um, people were fighting for their freedom at the time. Uh, the secular mindset would probably say, yeah, we need to fight for democracy, we need to fight for pluralism and things like that. Obviously not for religion, and religion is considered to be something dirty and, um, you know, unattractive. And nevertheless, medieval society was different. God was the most important thing in their lives, uh, the most important subject in their lives. Everything, the whole medieval mindset turned around God, whereas today the whole modern mindset turns around man himself, about man realizing himself, fulfilling himself. So there's a, there's a huge difference and this makes it sometimes very different to understand what was going on in those days and what was going on today. I know that um, the medieval men, if they could look in the future and they see what wars were fought about today, I mean they would just be absolutely horrified. Why do we fight wars? There's one tyrant against another tyrant and one needs to be protected against the other. Um, I just need to rem remind you of some of the wars in the Middle East, uh, which, like the Kuwait War, uh, there was one dictator who had taken something away from another dictator. The whole world got up in arms and uh, went down and uh, at, at high cost of human life and uh, equipment and everything else, um, the, uh, the situation was reversed and the dictator was given back uh, the land he had. And then you think, w stop, wait, what's going on here? Is this democracy? Is this is this real? You know, are we? I mean, obviously, Kuwait was free, freed. 
why didn't we just force the guy who was running it to introduce democracy if democracy is so valuable? Like a few years later, Iraq was done again and they introduced democracy um, in a country which wasn't really ready for it and, and we, uh, the West, I would say, gets a receipt later. Now, the medieval mindset would, or the medieval uh, observer would be horrified by what was going on, that there was fought. I mean, the obvious thing is, whatever happened in Kuwait was about oil. It was about the uh, secure, securing the, the corporate interests of, of some organizations and the lifestyles of people in the West. Yeah? And that's really what, uh, if you analyze what was going on there, what it came down to. And, and, and that's what it's all about. Yeah, I mean, it's quite horrendous when you when you look at that. Or we've got the the whole thing about an economic system, capitalism versus versus, versus socialism. I mean, obviously, one gave you the freedom to believe and to um, to believe in what you wanted. The other one enforced atheism on its people, on its population. But as far as an economic system is concerned, I mean, people in both. Hemispheres, the East and the West, they were pretty much screwed. If you were poor, you were poor. You wouldn't earn a lot of money. You could just have enough uh, to eat and live. And, and that was pretty much the same whether you lived in, in the Eastern Hemisphere or the Western Hemisphere. Uh, anyway, just making a point here <coughs> and getting a point across that um, today we think differently and we've got a different philosophy, most of us have. Um, and medieval man had, had a different idea as well. And what was important to him was his relationship with God. And that was what was happening in everyday life. Now, this was threatened by the guys from the East. Um, and what should they do? That's a big question. What should they do? Should they just let them come and, uh, you know, take over, take over Europe? And the answer is obviously no. It, it wasn't possible and it couldn't be done. What was the ambition for Europeans to join the Crusades? Um, number one, it was to protect their identity. It was to stop a conquest which were threatening their faith and it was heading to Europe. Uh, it was to help Christians in the East who, who were besieged. It was uh, to defend ancient Eastern European culture from being Arabized. And it was about defending the holy sites, yeah, which to them were very important. And um, probably the need wouldn't have been there if they had been treated with a bit more respect from, uh, from the side of the Muslims, including the pilgrims, if they were left alone. Today we fight for... Uh, Dictators or dictators fight against one another, so many wars are just down to personal ambitions. Uh, Second World War was a typical example <coughs> where there were some ideas, some strange ideas, and there was a personal ambition, and then uh, you had the big loggerhead between Stalin and Hitler. And it was all about big personalities just doing their thing and uh, you know creating their little empires. Uh, we find about economic systems, which one is better, which one is worse, and then sometimes there's retaliation, which is the recent war. And I would imagine whatever happened um, recently in uh, in America, that um, some of the stuff was just uh, retaliatory rather than settling some score. It was about settling scores rather than <coughs> doing anything else, including protecting, um, protecting the nation. Um, who knows? To sum it up, most wars are mostly about personal ambition for, of tyrants of economic interests of corporations. So we've got tyrants and corporations, and very often wars are, are fought around those, those two groups. Uh, unfortunately, uh, innocent people get tied into this. Um, I don't want to know how many people died in the last wars on both sides. Uh, not just, and, and, and then the next thing is, I don't want to know how, how many people had nothing to do with it. I mean, when we look at the recent Ukraine war, there's a very high fatality on civilians. Most civilians just want to carry on living. They are not interested whether they're part of Russia or they're part of the Ukraine. They just want to live. And, and yet they are the ones who seem to take the, the brunt of the, the war by, uh, by dying, you know, directly or indirectly through, through the war efforts. <coughs> so... In conclusion, it can be said that um, the Crusades were a defensive war, or the Crusades were defensive wars, and it managed to obstruct the onslaught on Europeans and delay further Islamic conquest in Europe for a few hundred years. So if you look at um, 1080, when the first Crusade started, um, the, um, the next Islamic onslaught on Europe, the siege of Vienna, which was right in the heart of Europe, was almost 
500 years, about 450 years later. So we could say there was a good 400 years where uh, the Islamic conquest in Europe was delayed by and, and held back. Uh, if it hadn't been for that war, there's a good chance that the Islamic conquest would have just carried on and uh, Europe would have been forcefully Islamized. Uh, maybe we would have held out like the Spanish and not cave into them. Uh, I don't know, but it would have been a different situation uh, when the armies are on your doorstep rather than when they are still outside the, the empire. Um, okay, in conclusion, it can be said that the Crusades were defensive, yeah, and they managed to obstruct the onslaught of Europeans and delay further Islamic conquest in Europe for a few hundred years. The cause for the Crusades was justified, it's my opinion. I think it had to be done. If it hadn't been done, um, there, there would have been, the table would have been turned around on the Europeans and we would have had to fight them in our land. Um, still, some excesses on, um, of the war on the side of the Crusaders, uh, Crusader armies was dubious. <coughs> I read some of the stories, I was interested in the Templars to see what they were getting up to. And when you read some of the, the stories of what was happening in the war, it was absolutely horrendous. Uh, uh, sort of execution of prisoners of war and so on. From today's perspective, even more so than, than within the context of its time, um, so it's it's quite um, you know quite quite horrendous and, and horrific uh, which which happened there. But uh, I think today it's called you know collateral damage or something. But nevertheless, even collateral damage is not right. You know when especially when rules are <clears throat> broken and when innocent people die needlessly or when people who surrender are, are murdered, it's not right. And that was what's happening on the Christian side as well as on the Islamic side. So there are stories from, from both sides coming on. So we need to bear this in mind. So it's not just, uh, you know, the evil Christians who came there and they went encroached on Islamic land. It's the other way around. The Islamic conquest uh, encroached on Christian lands. And uh, we, as the Christian community, had the right to defend our, our brothers and to protect them. You know, from uh, something they didn't want. They did not want Islam. They did not invite Islam. They had no interest in it. Neither did Europe have any interest in Islam. A Muslim seems to, seem to think that it's okay to kill and conquer on behalf of their prophet, so the conquest of Islam is perfectly justified. In the end, that's what he said, and that's what had to be done. <coughs> but when we defend ourselves, and when we... Um, we try to maintain status quo and to ensure the freedom we have to follow Christ, that is considered to be evil and uh, unacceptable on the on the sides of the Muslims. And is it? I, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think Europe had the right to defend itself. We were called to, to help our brothers in the East, Christian brothers in the East, and that's an historic fact that some of the documents which have been dug up, the call was answered, a war took place, uh, including all the fallacies of war, which is unfortunate. and. Uh, but to apologize for the Crusades, there's no way. Uh, the Crusades were justified and uh, and they should have happened and they needed to happen. Otherwise, uh, we would be sitting in the shadow of minarets today in Europe, which uh, slowly seems to be the case anyway. But uh, we could hold the minarets for a good, if you look at today, for a good 800 years to, to turn up in Europe. Uh, for once in, in that time, um, Europe was genuinely united. So you had French, British, German armies, you had Italian armies, uh, you had armies from all over Europe joining together and fighting the threat from the East. Europe said no thanks to the Prophet of Medina and Europe gladly accepted the risk of eternal damnation by not trusting in probably the most bloodthirsty prophet in the history of mankind. Uh, and I'm not just talking about what's happened after his death when, um, you know, the conquest took place, but when you look at his lifetime, read the Hadith, look at the number of people who died during his time and the, the death which were um, condoned by, by the Prophet from Medina. Um, there's an awful loss. In, in the Arabic mindset, it's perfectly okay. Uh, I don't know. I, I prefer my Messiah, who instead of killing people, Raised from, raised them from the dead. That's the difference between um, Jesus and Muhammad. Jesus <coughs> preached love, uh, not murder. 
Even though uh, he preached judgment as well for those who do not accept his message, Muhammad did the same, but he didn't call his disciples to kill those who do not accept the message. All he said is, walk away from them, shake the dust off your feet as a witness and testimony against them, and leave it at that. Yeah? And that is a Christian ethos. You know, We have got a message, we're going to preach it to you, and maybe you are Muslim and you are quite incensed by what I'm saying here. Um, we are not coming with a sword to you. We are just telling you, you know, Jesus has come, he died for you, he, um, he, he is God become flesh. He laid his life down for you just because out of love for you. And you can accept it or you can reject it. If you reject it, we won't go after you and kill you. But, uh, but that's not our job. That's, you see, that's God's job. One day you'll stand before God, and then you have to give answer what you did with his message of the cross, that Jesus died for you, that he has given and provided a way of forgiveness by, uh, by providing the perfect sacrifice. And if you are Muslim, this is one thing you will understand, the sacrifice, the shedding of innocent blood for your sins. You still do it today when you slaughter your sheep before you eat them and you have a little prayer to make the sheep halal. Um, that's what Jesus did once and for all. Your sheep is not going to save you and it's not going to you know, be there for any forgiveness of sins, but Jesus Christ was a perfect sacrifice. And if you accept what he has done, your sins are relinquished and you will be set free. It's up to you. It's your choice. We are not forcing you, but we don't want you to force us either. We want to stay with our God and we, uh, we have decided to live and to die for the freedom to follow Christ. It was for the love of the true God, for Christianity, for our Christian brothers and sisters in the East, uh, for the love of their families as well, for their nations and for future generations. There many Europeans gave up their wealth, their lives, to protect and to fight for what they treasured most. They laid down their lives for your freedom to follow Christ. This, um, let me just uh, get this. Um, there's a, a more in-depth essay on um, seismicradio.org so if you go to the resources tab and you scroll down there uh, is this art a link to this article so you can read it uh, yourself again and um, there is also a link by a professor called uh, an article, an essay by a professor called Thomas Madden from St. Louis in, in the States and he's an expert in, in this period of history and he, um, he wrote an alternative view on what was happening with the Crusades. I would like to encourage you, uh, regardless of whether you are a Muslim or a Christian, to, to really go into this. Also, you know, study from both sides. Look at some of the Islamic literature on this, this era, but also look at, um, look at some of the Christian literature uh, from, from all sides, the Orthodox, like what was happening in Constantinople, as well as um, you know, from, obviously, at, at the time, the, what was coming from the Vatican. Um, it is a, a very, you know, emotive period, and, and obviously I don't want to upset anybody with this talk, I just want to, to set the record straight to a certain extent, because one thing which has happened in recent years is, uh, you know, it, Muslims are shouting really loud about this issue, and Christians just say, oh yeah, this was wrong, you know, really sorry, we don't want to do this, and it's just a spineless resp response, it wasn't wrong, it was a defense. If we wanted to defend our culture, if we wanted to defend Europe, and obviously we had later the great periods of the Reformation and, and, and other things which came a few hundred years after, after the Crusades finished, uh, then uh, the only way to maintain status quo in Europe and to have the freedom to follow Christ and to study the scriptures, the Bible, uh, was by, by opposing this conquest as it was taking place and not just staying silent. Two-thirds of Christianity at the time had been, had been subjugated to Islam. And they were majorities, they weren't minorities, but they were majorities of people who were pursuing Christianity. And that was okay according to the, the Muslim hordes and according to modern Islamic scholars. That's perfectly acceptable. But to defend ourselves and to stop them from, from hitting Europe, that's not acceptable. That, that's really wrong. That's, that's the message we get. Uh, all I have to say is, I'm sorry, it's not wrong. We did the right thing. We had to do it. And, and I hope, should it happen again, that, that we will, as it looks like, I mean, I don't know how successful these guys are going to be in, in Syria. I hope they won't. But um, unfortunately, and this is maybe a last warning, I'm going to finish on this note. 
I hope that we would stand up to fight them. America, at the moment, is not standing up to fight them. Uh, the message which is coming through, no ground forces to protect Christians. Uh, I think the answer why this is ta taking place is pretty obvious, as I mentioned before. But, but one thing, and this is a warning to Europe as well, Euro Europe has fallen away from, from the values and the, the ethics it had for many, many years. Europe was a Christian continent for many, many years, and it's fallen away, it's given up. And Jesus prophesied about this. He said, you know, before he comes back, there'll be the great falling away. People just are not bothered, they're not interested. That's what he said. And, uh, and my warning to you, Europe, is, and maybe to America too, and now that America is not quite as bad and quite as extreme as it is in Europe, that uh, if you don't return to God, if you don't return to your roots, to the God of your ancestors, to Jesus Christ, that uh, you are making yourself very vulnerable, that you shouldn't be surprised when one day you have the Islamic courts in London, in Berlin, and in other places. Christianity is a very benevolent religion. We don't kill people, we don't murder them, we don't use a sword to persuade people, we use love and the Spirit of God to persuade people of the truth in Jesus Christ. That is the way we function. We don't kill people, we don't murder people in order to convert them to Christianity. That's not what we do. These guys do it, and you can see this in, in Syria all the time. What they are doing is actually scriptural, according to their books. And, and Europe, you shouldn't be surprised if, uh, if one day in your capitals you've got these groups standing there, you know, beheading people in the, in the squares of Paris and Berlin uh, and to force you to adopt their faith. I'm sure you're going to do it wholeheartedly if, uh, if you know that, that those thoughts are killing you if you don't do it. Okay, I shall leave on this note. That's um, a little message. Europe, turn back to Christ. If you don't turn back to Christ, don't be surprised if judgment is going to hit you right in the heart of where you are. And um, if you are forced to follow a religion you don't want and you don't like and you never, you never wanted to follow. Um, nevertheless, and this is a credit to those guys who gave up everything to follow the Crusades, who gave up their wealth, their families, who gave up their lives, uh, for the sake of Christ and for the sake of their nations to protect them from this onslaught. Uh, guys, you've done a good job. Uh, at least for, for a good 800 years, Europe was free. Uh, seems to be a different story now. Uh, Europe has given up God, has embraced secularism and is now on the fast way downhill, getting ready for God's judgment to be executed upon, upon Europe. And who knows, maybe maybe some parts of America as well. I don't know which way America is going. My American friends over there, I hope you will not go the way of Europe and you will stick to, uh, to, uh, to the gospel and to the message of the gospel. I know there are great movements in Brazil where many people are turning to Christ right, left and center. I know the United States, there have been many movements about people turning to Christ. Uh, it's, it's going the other way now. Canada as well, so there's good news about America. I would like to encourage you to, to really stick with this and to be strong in God. And uh, my opinion, my firm opinion is, if you are standing tight and you are standing strong on the Word of God and you um, surrender your nation to God in prayer, you will be protected and you don't have to fear anything from these guys. Okay, God bless and uh, uh, give us some comments. I, I'm sure there are going to be a lot of hate comments. But that's okay, that's okay. In the end, it's a debate. I'm sure I'm not getting everything right. There's no question about that. I'm not perfect. I've got a view. Uh, my view certainly is uh, it's not objective. But then again, I would say to anybody here on earth that nobody's got an objective view. The only objective view is God's view. And I think that's probably the lowest common denominator I can agree with, with uh, any Muslim who is listening to this talk, that God's view is perfect and uh, all our views are slightly moved one way or the other. Anyway, uh, God bless and um, thank you for watching this talk. Uh, finally, if you want to check out, uh, I would really encourage you to, I'm just going to uh, scroll down here, by uh, Professor Thomas Madden, um, the talk or the essay you can find at seismicready.org. Go to the resources section, uh, scroll down, I think I've got it here, uh, Seismic Radio. This is Seismic Radio. Uh, right, 
go to the resources section. I've forgotten I'm on YouTube, so we can do this. I'm going to click on the resources section. And then you see a lot of interesting bits and bobs on the website. And right at the bottom, as you scroll down, uh, it's not there. Uh, let me just press the refresh button. It's just been put on, and there it is. Right at the bottom, if you scroll down, we've got the Crusades and Act of Love. Um, and you've got uh, an essay here by uh, Professor uh, Madden. So if I click on here, it comes up. And um, it's a PDF file. And you can sort of read this. It's got about eight, nine pages. And it, it sort of looks at a lot of historical facts which have been dug out and very often in history have been forgotten. So it's very, very small. If you're interested in this subject, just, just go through it and read through it. And even if you are Muslim, uh, I mean, one thing you need to do really is uh, look at it from both sides. It's not just from your side um, where you are told that there was something terrible which was done by, by the Christians. And I think you would you would totally agree with that, that everybody's got a right to defend himself. And, um, and I just happen to believe if we are Christians and we don't want to convert to Islam, we've got a right to defend ourselves and uh, not to be subjugated to your religion. And that's Professor Madden down there, okay? So that's uh, pretty much a point I want to make. Uh, by the way, by the, way the, uh, the guy, Professor Madden, I'm quite extreme in my view. He's not that extreme. He's very, um, I don't know, uh, almost quite apologetic, but he just provides a different view on this. Okay, so uh, God bless yeah, to all our Muslim listeners. Wa alaikum salam. Um, and I hope... Uh, it's not been too upsetting for you if you're from the other side. But if you are, uh, feel free to comment and to make your points about about the terrible things the Christians have done in defending themselves, their people, and their brothers in the Middle East. Okay, God bless. Bye-bye.